Uh, okay, wait. Hello, everyone. Um, is this microphone distance okay? Good. Uh, so, yeah. Hi, I'm Tobias. I'm on the design team. I uh, work for Purism, where I'm also on the design team. And uh, basically, my job there is to bring GNOME to mobile and everything that entails, kind of like from the design side, whether that's working on apps or the shell or patterns. And it's sort of like our entire approach is to do things upstream. So essentially, what that means I work on GNOME upstream for the most part. Um, this talk is essentially about, so if you've seen my talk last year, this is going to be very similar to that, but updated with all the new stuff that happened since then. And um, basically, I want to talk about what sort of is GNOME Mobile right now, where do we want to go with it, um, what sort of do we already have, and kind of like what are the implications on the application development experience from that. So to start with, um, GNOME Mobile isn't just a Librem 5 anymore. That's the phone I work on. That's what Purim is building. Um, but other people are starting to kind of like be interested in, in the project. Um, I've seen it run on like post market OS on Android phones. Um, there's other like uh, Linux based phone projects. So it's like I've seen it run on the Pine board, I think. Um, and so like it, this is this is growing beyond just like our project. And there's been a lot of like community interest in the library that we're working on, LibHandy for like various widgets. So it's n sort of like growing to be a, a bigger thing, and we're hoping that this will continue to a future where there will be many phones running GNOME the way you can do it on many laptops now. Um, to start with, what is GNOME Mobile right now? Um, because sort of like the, the there are various components to it, and it's it's maybe not immediately clear sort of what, what all of that entails. Um, like a very simplified, um, uh, and probably mostly wrong, like chart of the stack is essentially like you have some kind of distro, whether that's like Debian in our case or post market OS or whatever. Um, running there, you have the regular GNOME stack with currently some small patches on the GTK side for reasons that I'll get into later. Um, but that we do want to upstream, just like to be super clear at every stage here. Um, there is a shell, which is not GNOME shell, uh, for reasons that are probably better explained by Guido or the developers, but from what I understand, basically, like, complexity and performance were the reasons why that was sort of decided at the time. Uh, it's like a Wayland shell and compositor. And then there's sort of at the application, like, user-facing layer, there's just regular GNOME apps. But obviously, like, the interface for those needs to be adapted. And for that, there's libhandy, which makes it easy. But it doesn't have to be live handy. It's just like they need to work like on the form factor. Um, so to start with, let's sort of talk a little bit about the shell to get that out of the way. But that's not really the main focus for this talk. Um, on the shell side, there's not as much exciting stuff um, to show as I would like, because like basically all the things that we've been working on for the past few months are like this close to being merged, um, and they're not really like in a, in a state to show you, but these are like a few screenshots of stuff that I, these are screenshots I took yesterday on the dev kit, uh, or rather, from the VM of the image that you run in the dev kit. And like, as you can see, it's not really as polished yet as I would like. Um, most of this stuff will change like within the next two months, so let's not spend too much time on it. The design direction is still the same as it was last year. Like we're working towards essentially bringing GNOME Shell to the mobile form factor um, with essentially the same feature set and a very similar kind of structure. Um, and uh, yeah, so that, that's that's basically still still the direction there. Um, there's there are a number of like very cool community contributors who have helped a lot with that, uh, particularly uh, Xander Brown and Alexander Mikhailenko whom I'll mention many more times in this talk, I think, because they're very cool, uh, and many others. Um, but so in general, sort of like from a strategic point of view, it, the idea is it's the same familiar structure from GNOME Shell. You have an overview, you're like in an app, or you're like in, in the app drawer, uh, and there's sort of like a system area at the top where it's notifications, like all, all of the familiar stuff from GNOME Shell, uh, which sort of has an interesting historical uh, kind of like um, connection because a lot of those ideas in GNOME Shell originally came from WebOS and then sort of like are now going full circle back to mobile. 
<laughs> which is, which is kind of cool, I guess. Um, and one of, uh, so a few of the other things here are that there are a few things in desktop GNOME shell which we'd really like to address. Like we would like to have to, we would like to have a cleaner spatial model of like always knowing where things come from and have like animations that are more purposeful, which we're working on getting better there too, but it's slightly harder on the desktop. And on, in this shell, like we'd like to get that right from the start. Um, and the other thing is um, another sort of area of, of interest for me is sort of like moving beyond the, the like Windows 95 floating window paradigm and trying some better alternatives to that. And that's also hard on the desktop due to legacy apps. But here we have a slightly freer hand, so I think it's going to be a very interesting place to try new ideas that we might want to bring to desktop GNOME shell, sort of like from a design perspective. Um, moving on to apps, this is kind of the, the focus area, the main focus area for me, what I've w mostly worked on for the past year. Um, and essentially, it just entails like bringing regular GNOME apps to a smaller form factor and making sure like it, that it makes sense there. Um, these are just like a few random screenshots that I don't want to spend too much time on because I'm going to show a lot of demos later. Um, and the strategy there is sort of take regular GNOME apps, um, sort of do what is necessary to make the UI work uh, at the smaller interfaces, but still keep them sort of usable at all sizes. And usually what we've noticed is um, this, this like added flexibility of being able to use them at smaller sizes also makes them better at like larger sizes. Because often what you have with older layouts is the developer just assumes like a certain fixed size, which doesn't work that great in, in many scenarios, such as like, I don't know, tiled apps on the side and stuff like that. And so this added flexibility kind of improves things for everyone um, uh, in, in a way that uh, sort of I haven't really seen done anywhere in like other uh, sort of projects that, that try to like bridge, bridge form factors in this way. Uh, so I think that's pretty cool. And libhandy is essentially a library of GTK widgets that Purism is currently like maintaining, but there are a number of like uh, other contributors from the GNOME community. And we would really like to upstream in sort of the best way possible as soon as possible. Um, so I've, I've like had the word adaptive there. Let's talk about what that means. Uh, I think the, the word adaptive design came from Adrian when he did his first experiments, like, I don't know, two years back or something. Um, but if you're familiar with um, responsive web design, it's basically that. Um, if you maybe remember, like, I don't know, in the, like, ten years ago or so, like, in the early days of mobile, uh, websites used to, like, have two separate websites, where it was, like, the regular full desktop website, and then, like, a very small, shitty mobile version with, like, a odd kind of navigation that didn't have all the features. Uh, and then eventually people realized that it's kind of easier to just make one website that sort of you start at the smallest form factor and you like so slowly do progressive enhancement as you have more space. And that, that is essentially the same approach with adaptive design. Um, I'm actually not sure why we're not using the word responsive. That's maybe a question for Adrian. Uh, <laughs> does Adrian want to answer? Okay, we'll, uh, we'll have Adrian answer this later. Stay tuned. Um, but essentially the idea is like you have the same features on all the form factors um, and you don't like have separate modes, like you don't have like this one whole separate app for mobile and this whole separate app for like tablet and this whole separate app for desktop. Um, because like in practice it's much more complicated, you can have like a phone with a keyboard plugged in and you can have, I don't know, a huge touch screen, like it, it, there's not like really these very well defined categories in, in the real world. And uh, what you do instead is like you sort of check for certain conditions, like if there is a keyboard, then we do certain things. If the screen is smaller than X, we do another thing. Um, and we've found this approach to like, work quite well for, for us so far. Um, and like, in, in my opinion, like, the web is the only platform that has kind of solved this, and this is also what, what they do there. So I feel like this, this is a good direction forward. Um, so with this introduction out of the way, let's talk about designing mobile apps, except not really, because you're never just designing for mobile, as we just said. You're also designing for the larger form factors. You're just sort of making sure that, um, that they work at all of them well. Um, in my experience, there are kind of like sort of three main areas that you need to think about there. 
you need to make sure the navigation works um, because that can be, th that's like a very core thing that like really impacts all, all areas of the application. And so that's a lot of, a lot of our pattern work has gone into the, in the navigation category. Obviously the content, like are you gonna have a grid of things, a list of things, sort of make sure that the content can, can fit. Um, and then there's sort of this mushy territory of just like the specific controls in this application in this application need to like work at every form factor. And that's not really like something you can solve for all apps. It's an actual thing you need to design for any app. And it's, it's not really uh, sort of, there are, there are some best practices, but it's, um, it's just design. Uh, so let's start with navigation. In GNOME, we generally have like three core patterns. There's sort of like the stack with the back button, like you go into a detail view and you go back. There's the switcher where you just have a number of, of uh, high level view, view also like of similarly important high level views. And then there's sidebar patterns. Um, for stacks, it's probably the simplest thing. I don't think I need to explain to you how this works well on mobile without doing really much. From a navigation perspective, like you have a main view, um, you click a thing, you go back. All the mobile platforms already do that and um, that just like requires making the window smaller. Um, the, the switcher is, is another pattern that we do a lot, which is essentially like for apps where you have a number of things that are all important and that need to be like easily accessible. Um, and essentially sort of you want them to be available at, at the top level. The problem that we face there is like the stack switcher that, that we had in, or that we have in GNOME has regular sized text labels and if the translation gets long, it is long. Um, and I mean part of that is just like finding good strings for the translations. But part of it is also like the text size like really puts constraints there on, on how much you can do. And uh, so we thought about this a lot and eventually came to this solution, which is essentially like takes, takes a lot of inspiration from what, for example, the iPad does and a number of the mobile platforms uh, where they have this more flexible pattern with like an icon and that way you can make the text smaller and put it below, uh, which gives you that flexibility at the smaller sizes while still sort of keeping it nice at the, at the larger ones. And this widget landed like, I don't know, pretty recently, so it's not used in a lot of places yet. Uh, but I can show you a demo of clocks, which essentially like this is the mobile view where it's at the bottom. And wait, let me maybe show it to you all the way from here. So you start like at the, at the biggest size and everything fits so it's all good. Uh, you resize it to here and like, once it doesn't fit anymore, it like, will move the labels below. Um, at a certain point, uh, like even that isn't enough. So then we just move it to the bottom, which conveniently also is good for like reachability on mobile, but like it's only one of the reasons why, why, that, why we did that. Um, so and the widget for that is HDY view switcher. Um, thanks to Xander Brown for like first prototyping that and to Adrian for making it all happen and like sort of getting it in and stuff. Um, and then the third major pattern is sort of sidebar, sidebar -y things, uh, which we call also split header bar sometimes because essentially like you just have the whole app is like split at, at, at a certain point um, horizontally. And obviously you can't really do that on a portrait phone screen because you don't have enough width. So what we do and what lots of other platforms have done before is you just like split it essentially in a stack pattern where you have the two screens separately. Um, quick demo for that, but I don't think this is super exciting for anyone anymore because we've had it for a while. Uh, you like resize it and you only get one of the views and there's actually a nice animation which a lot of the like other implementations of this don't have. So I think we can be kind of proud of that. And then yeah, it's just like a standard sidebar. Um, can't go back and all of that. And then next up is lists. Um, most of our UI is lists of one sort or another, so that's pretty important. And uh, a lot of it is this thing we call list boxes, which sort of have the white background and the border. And that's a very nice and flexible pattern that we like. Uh, and basically, we don't have a widget for it. So um, there's a lot of sort of weird and different implementations of, of those patterns all around our apps and like even in settings there's like a whole bunch of different ones. Um, and sort of it 
it would be really nice, and so we've, we found uh, working on various things for mobile that it would be nice to like, have a, an actual widget for this stuff, um, which was which ended up being this, which is uh, HDY combo row or something like that. A num number of widgets called HDY row something, um, which sort of like mean you don't have to fiddle with the padding and stuff around these rows. These are like not the definitive new pattern. Like I think we'll, we'll maybe want to do some more design changes when we upstream this. But it's like a step in the direction of having like a unified list row widget, which would be very nice. Um, and then the other thing here is uh, like another thing you want with lists is you don't want them to like explode when you resize them to a bigger size and you want them to like scale nicely. And we have this nice kind of like um, resizing behavior here where like it will smoothly scale as you, as you resize the window. And then there's a maximum width at some point. Then preferences, uh, in, or like rather in-app preferences in this case. So um, in-app preferences are a area where like we, we've sort of had some, uh, we have some sort of need for cleanup in a lot of areas. Uh, we have a lot of dialogues like this with like this notebook and the huge row of checkboxes and it all looks kind of old and crafty. And this sort of the, the mobile effort was uh, sort of an opportunity to, to make something nicer for that. And um, I can show you this, which is basically like, it's called the uh, HUI preferences window, I think, but there's a number of other widgets inside it. Um, so like it's, you have the window and then you have like the, the various views where you can so like do settings, but then there's also search, which is very exciting. Um, so you can actually like search in the in-app preferences, which I personally find very useful. Um, and this, like once we upstream this, will hopefully like provide like a unified pattern for, for all of these in-app preferences, which currently are kind of disjointed and not that great. Um, then, right, now we're getting to the, the thing I mentioned earlier with the GTK patches, where there are some things that it doesn't really make sense to have every app kind of like uh, use a separate version of it, it's just like to make it work on mobile, because it's kind of expected to have it come from the toolkit. Um, and we needed something kind of soon for the phone, so the, the short-term solution was to basically like make light sort of ports of, of a few of these uh, uh, GTK dialogues to fit on the, on the phone form factor. Uh, Design-wise, these definitely need some work. And uh, longer term, I mean, especially the, the about dialogue, for example, we've wanted to redesign for a long time, so maybe sooner or later, like, we'll, we'll do a proper redesign that is actually adaptive and uh, has all the nice things that we would want on the desktop as well. But right now, this is where we're at. These patches are being shipped like on the on the phone, like with GTK, um, and so apps kind of like get them for free instead of everyone having to include their own about dialog. It's not great right now, but it's gonna get better. Uh, another thing that's only tangentially related, but I wanted to mention because I don't know, it's cool and I worked on it, and it's part of the app developer experience in general. Is kind of app icons like. The, the previous app icon guidelines, I mean, probably most of you have seen Jakob's talk yesterday or are familiar with this because it's not that new. Uh, the previous app icons were very hard to make for third party developers and kind of like part of the idea of having like more people come and make apps for you know, mobile was like, what are they gonna do for icons? Uh, we don't have a great story there. So this was also part of the, part of the reason why I was interested in that. And uh, yeah, we have new guidelines now. There's Icons are much easier to make, and we have some cool tools. Um, I'm not gonna show you icon preview because uh, Jakob already did that yesterday, but I'm gonna show you some other stuff, such as this nice color palette, which Xander made kind of randomly because he wanted to. He's very cool. Um, and this other thing, uh, which is icon library, where you can search for symbolic icons, uh, which Bilal made because he's also very cool. And a contrast checker, which is, I don't know, I, I just like how this thing looks. Uh, it's not super related to icons, but I don't know. It's, it's made by the same people and like, it's, it's a fun time uh, making little apps with, with those guys. Um, so thanks guys. Um, so yeah, that's 
somewhat tangential, but also like people can use it for the phone, so I'm mentioning it. Um, this kind of wraps up most of the major uh, patterny things that you need to, to make GNOME apps fit on phones. I'm going to show you in a little bit sort of like some more concrete examples. Um, but there's some other stuff coming very soon that's going to be very cool, so I want to show you that. Um, so the first one is whenever you have like a sort of a, a list of things or like a slideshow kind of, kind of pattern, um, on touch there's always these nice gestures where you can like swipe and there's like inertia and it will move to the next slide and all of that. And we don't really have that yet, we have these buttons, that's not as nice. Um, but uh, I think this landed in Lipandy like last week. Now we have a paginator widget, which is very exciting and I will show you now. Um, like, so this works on both touch and touchpad, but like essentially you can swipe between stuff and it works and look at this, inertia, oh yeah. Um, so this is very cool and you can, I don't know, make it vertical and other things, whatever. Anyway, this is very exciting and you can use it in a lot of places and um, especially on the phone like when you want to swipe between stuff, this is something you really want. So uh, this is something Alexander Mikhailenko worked on and it's amazing. I just wanted to mention this uh, because, um, right. So the other thing is in some cases what you have is a sidebar that isn't really like a main view, like you can't really split it sort of into the master detail pattern. Um, so what you really want is like a sort of a separate tangential view, like for example in, in a PDF viewer that's like the sidebar, you don't want that to be the main view really. Uh, and for that there's a new widget that's gonna be coming soon I think. Um, I've already seen it working and like I, I'm, I'm not sure like what's, what is missing but I think it's going to be there pretty soon which is a drawer which is not this one, let me find the right one, uh, there we go, not this one either, this guy. Uh, and so you can swipe in from the side and you have this nice, and it's the same motion, it's also Alexander's work um, and so you, you basically for those kind of cases where you uh, where you need to like swipe in something from the side. Uh, I don't expect we'll be using this a ton because in most cases that's not really what you want. Um, but there are some cases where so we have this tangential thing off the s to the side and you want to swipe it in, so there's that. And then the other thing which I'm also very excited about is um, on mobile platforms a lot of the time you have like this back button on the bottom um, or you had in the case of Windows Phone. Um, because like it's hard to reach the back button at the top, but obviously like flipping the whole like header bar logic just for that uh, has a lot of implications and like sort of that that's a very hard kind of like change to make, especially because like you know we read from top to bottom and all of that. So uh, th it's not really something that you can generally do. But what a lot of other platforms also do is a sort of a back swipe gesture, and. Uh, that's another thing that we will hopefully have soon if I find the right window. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo, there we go. Um, so essentially you like have a list of things and you can open one and you can click the back button but you can also swipe the whole thing and it does it with the header bar and it fucking works. Seriously, clap. <laughs> this is amazing. Anyway, um, so there, there's that and then uh, some case studies for kind of like apps that we ported and that we're gonna port still. Um, so there's Fractal, which is a project I've been involved with for a long time, I guess, since the kind of the very beginning. Um, and over the winter, like Chris Davis has ported that uh, to sort of all of the new widgets, and it now works and just like kind of looks like uh, an app that you could use on a phone and that's pretty nice and you can like do stuff and go into secret channels and look at <laughs> things and yeah, uh, I don't know. There's also, I don't know what else is there, account settings. You can see my email which is very exciting. Um, and yeah, there's, it's an app that works and we ported it. Um, and then another thing is an app that I've done a bunch of design for but it's not really um, like we've not really started development on that yet, which is Geary, or I mean just in general, like a mail app sort of that, that fits in this pattern. Geary specifically is interesting because it's one of those apps where there are um, 
there, there are some sort of weird corner things that you really notice when you want to port it to mobile. So like, for example, the header bar um, at the left side is split, it's not split like over the, over the sidebar. So um, you have three panels on the bottom and only two in the header bar. And so if you wanted to split that, that wouldn't super work, right? Like you can't cleanly split that into three views. And there are some other things like the way the buttons are arrayed and like the functions are, it, when you sort of, it, on, if you have a ton of space, it's like pretty easy to be like, yeah, this is fine. But like when you actually need to fit it onto a smaller screen, like you really need to focus. And I found that's like very helpful just like in thinking about interfaces. So like this is, there's just like a few of the screens, there, there are many more. Uh, but like how you would split this to mobile cleanly. Um, and sort of, as you can see, actually there's a rendering error there on the slides, but anyway, um, when, <laughs> when you sort of move this to mobile, it really like helps you clean up things. Um, and then when you bring that back to sort of desktop, like from a whole adaptive perspective, the whole thing just looks much cleaner. And I found that's, that's a kind of a cool, that's kind of a cool side benefit. Um, and these are just some amazing people who have made, who have helped make all of this possible. Uh, I want to mention some of them specifically. Adrian, who is doing all of the amazing work on LibHandy, and Guido, <laughs> give it up. Uh, and Guido, who's also done a lot of stuff, like he sort of is the co-maintainer and original author of LibHandy. He came up with a great name also. Um, and then uh, sort of like they, those two are at Purism, uh, but then there's Xander and Alexander who on all sorts of things have done so much amazing work and I've probably not mentioned half of it, uh, but really those guys are amazing. Um, and then there are a number of other people from the community, Chris, Bilal, Felix, Jordan, Julian, others that like wouldn't fit on the slide, but like, there, there are a lot of people across our community who are really interested in this and have helped a lot. And thanks to them, I can show you all these nice things. So, uh, so yeah, with sort of like all of these things in mind, um, we now have most of the widgets that we need to actually port the majority of our apps to mobile. Like, if, if you remember, like, the things you need to do sort of to make an app adaptive, uh, navigation, content, and then, like, the mushy design part, the first two, for the most part, are figured out. The third one is essentially what we need to do for every app and then port it. Um, so if you maintain an app, if you contribute to an app, if you're interested to bring that to more form factors, um, talk to me talk to other people around here who are interested in it. Adrian is over there, Julian is there. Um, let's make this happen and yeah, it's gonna be cool. Um, and these are some places that you can also go on the internet to get involved. Thank you very much. And if there are any questions, let me know. Um, Hello. Thanks to BS for this presentation. It's very exciting to see all these things. Um, I'm wondering, um, so all of those um, slides that are presented, they allow us to make our windows smaller. Should we be caring about making our windows bigger as well, such as, you know, super high DPI displays, large and or ultra wide ones, things like that? Because getting a regular, a regular app and putting them on those form factors also doesn't work very well. Right. right. Um, so one of the things that, that I found is that usually the, the problem like <laughs> with bigger displays is kind of similar to the one with smaller displays. Like if you make it bigger, like the layout just kind of falls apart. Uh, but if you do the same thing, like for example, like with all these, these column patterns, um, like you, you couldn't resize it to small um, because like there was a minimum width or whatever. Um, 
but you couldn't make a big eater because if you made it huge, like then the text rows would be like the entire screen. Um, and sort of one of the side benefits of a lot of the stuff we're making stuff work in mobile is that it will work better on those huge screens also. That's just for making it work. If you want to like optimize to use every pixel of those screens, that's a very different kind of uh, kind of exercise. Uh, but it does fit in the same paradigm where like you sort of you you know what the features are going to be. You start with like the most constrained environment, and you kind of like progressively enhance from there, just like we do on the web, right? Um, and I think like philosophically, that's that's all part of the same kind of the same uh, line of thinking. It would require more widgets that do more crazy things than just like a column. Like I don't know, Builder does this like thing where it, like puts the column next to each other. I'm not sure if that's what we would want everywhere, but. Yeah, I mean, it, it's definitely an area that we could think about more in this vein. Any other questions? Uh, thanks for the presentation. I think it's all very exciting. But my uh, my question is. Um, uh, have you, do you have any roadmap? Uh, uh, do you want to uh, merge the, all those new widgets into GTK in the future? Because, so that uh, all our platform could use them. Thanks. Uh, this is a question for the guy over there. <laughs> uh, Adrian is the maintainer of Flipendi, so, or one of the maintainers. Um, ideally, yeah, um, what we really want is to port them to GTK4. And what I, when I mean GTK4, I do mean GTK4 itself, when relevant, and to try to fuse what makes sense directly into GTK. Ideally, I would love if there was no Lib GTK4 versions of Libandi. We just have that library because we needed a place to prototype things and to you know, progress fast. Yeah, and one of the other things that we've been discussing, because a lot of the things that you've seen here are not super mobile specific. They're just like nice things to have when you're building GNOME apps. Um, and we would like more of that. We've discussed it on the design team a lot. I think Alan talked about it. We would like better sort of development support for the design patterns we have. Um, and w one of the ideas we've been discussing is maybe not all of that needs to be in GTK because we might want it to move faster than GTK. Um, and we don't want to be constrained by the same stability guarantees. So, like, one of the ideas could be, like, instead of la having lib handy in the future, just gonna be just like lib gnome hig or something that, like, has all of the hig patterns, which includes some of the, the stuff, but ideally also more other things. Like, for example, one of the things we've been discussing recently is, like, avatars, of which we have, like, seven different implementations in different places uh, that are, like, copy pasted and stuff all over the place. So, there's a lot to do in this area, and uh, we would like to do sort of as much of that as possible, like in an upstream, like sort of unified way. Another question over there. Uh, so thank you for your presentation. It was uh, I, I was pretty hyped after that. Shame on you. <laughs> um, so um, I I want to ask you if uh, the full shell, which will be available on the Purism phones later on the Librem phones, uh, will it be available for installation on? Like a normal distribution on computers with like a touch screen that uh, I mean uh, that's just a matter of packaging, I think it, like there's nothing stopping you from using I think actually Guido, our like main fosh developer, like uses it on his laptop, so it, I mean once it's more mature, I'm sure people will package it I guess I don't know okay, okay, so uh, f uh fosh will also just have some features that. Um, uh, he help on tablets, or will it be only phone uh, centric? No, the idea is for that to eventually also support bigger form factors. 
but it doesn't right now. So I mean, but that's what I meant with like some of the floating window stuff. Like, um, as as support for like bigger screens will come for that, because I think part of the idea with like having an actual phone running like a full GNU Linux OS is that you can plug in a monitor and stuff. So that's definitely something that they're thinking about. On the design side, there's not been like a ton of work for that yet because the mobile stuff comes first. But yeah, I mean, the, the idea is to eventually scale that up um, to the extent where it like makes sense. Great, thank you. Uh, I think Cassidy had another question earlier, but maybe he doesn't anymore. All right. Then if that's it, thank you very much.